Is that too loud, Jimmy? Should I turn it down? Or no, I think you're good. I think you're good. You're coming in loud and clear. All right. I think we are good live on the Metal Voice. First time we've had uh, Steve Whiteman from uh, Kix. You even said it right. show. Yes. <laughs> is there a wrong way to say it? Whitman. I get that a lot. Steve it's Whitman, Whitman, isn't it? Yes, it is Whiteman. Steve Whiteman. Yeah. Exactly. I can read. I can read. I can read. Right. <laughs> Those people can't. <laughs> All right. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me just record this just in case everything goes south. All right, good. Recording in progress. There we go. There we All go. right. Today on the Metal Voice, You're Welcome, which was released on July the 2nd. Steve Whiteman's first solo album ever. <laughs> you know what? That That's kind of not true because I had uh, a band called Funny Money that I did yeah. most of the writing. The first, the first couple albums were all my stuff, but I didn't want to call it the Steve Whiteman band. I wanted it to be a band. So mm -hmm. we called it Funny Money, but basically... But, you know they were my they were my records as well but this is the first album under my name yeah yeah so i guess the big question is you have kicks you have your solo album music i don't know alan no did you feel that it was more of a solo album or a kicks album I, and steve jump in like what's the difference i don't know where that line is well, I was writing this stuff, you know, in hopes that uh, the boys and kicks would like some of the of the songs. I don't expect every song that you write to be, you know, accepted by the band. But um, I don't think the band was in a position to want to record a, a new album at this point. So uh, COVID just came along and gave me an opportunity to get together. Jimmy Jimmy Chalfont actually suggested it because him, him and Brad Divins were getting together and just doing cover songs and putting them up mm -hmm. on Facebook and Jimmy said to Brad, you know, Steve's sitting on a pile of songs. Why don't we get him over here and record a couple of originals? And that just kind of kicked off the whole thing and sat down with Brad and Jimmy. And we, I played him like 12 tracks and he just looked at me and said, let's do them all. So I <laughs> thought, well, we're making a Steve Whiteman album, aren't we? He said, I think so. And it, it just kept, you know, it, it, it was a lot of fun. It gave us something to do during COVID. And um, it, it actually turned out really, really well. Yeah, I think so too, Alan. No, I mean, usually we try to be ahead of the curve and promote the albums before they come out. But you know what? We'll do a, We'll get a second win going here and try to <laughs> try to whip up some more interest into the album here. This I like that. I like it. <laughs> second coming. <laughs> so going back like in the day, we, we joke about this all the time. You know, back in the day, the 80s, we had enough money maybe to buy one album and we wanted to get 30. And uh, for myself, I, I apologize ahead of time, Steve. Kicks fell through the cracks for me. Uh, it was hard to find their albums here in Montreal. And uh, but going back, listening to the solo album, revisiting some of the kick stuff from the eighties, I, I I kind of regret that because it sounds like something that was right up my alleys. Well, you're not alone, believe me. A, a lot of people didn't know about us, and 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 in fact, the, the the current touring that we've been doing, I think we've reached more people in the past eight years than we had in the in the whole eighteen years that we were together and releasing albums on Atlantic Records. So, you're not alone there. You know what I remember? Like Hip Parade Magazine with everyone who had a little kid. Yeah. That's, Same here. That's Look, that's what I pulled out too. <laughs> what, the record company didn't back you guys? Or? Not hardly at all. They Crazy. didn't do anything. They didn't do anything until Blow My Fuse, until that record started to take off in areas outside of our little comfort zone. When, when it took off in, in Kansas and it took off in other areas, that's when the record company thought, Okay, I, I I think I think this band's ready to pop, but until that point, yeah, we did all of our we paid for all of our own touring. We paid for that that stupid little advertisement and hip parade. Or we paid for everything, and we were just relentless. We were I mean, most people would have said fuck this and quit, but we we were too stupid to do that, and we believed in what we were doing. Steve, no, but that's it. Going reading reading the promo, you know, your first album came out in '81, and and I I revisited all my old hip paraders a couple of months ago, and I'm like. Kicks was there in 83, 82, you know? I was very surprised because in my head, it was that album that came yeah. out in the late 80s. 88, 89. And I was just blown away how early you guys were around, so. Well, we were lucky enough to have fans on the East Coast that, that really supported us and, and kept us alive. And we would sell just enough records to get re-upped for another album. So, but Atlantic <laughs> never really pushed uh, the first three at all. And it was, you know, it was, it was hard, it was disappointing. But like I say, we believed in ourselves and our fans believed in us and we were still having a pretty damn good time. 
I, I just have you ever played in Canada? Did you ever tour in Canada? We played Toronto one time, and we got we got stopped at the border for about three hours, and they searched our bus, <laughs> and it was uh I was I think I was Jack Daniels drunk, and I pissed them off, and it was it was not a it was not a good it was not a good night. So we never really had the desire to go back, and we were never really uh, invited back. So oh. just it's just a Canadian a hospitality. Eh? Yeah, I mean <laughs> we're I, known for being really notorious. mean. <laughs> They're notorious for stopping tour buses and and making you get out in the middle of the night, and it's freezing ass cold, and it was not a pleasant experience. Actually, I just want to go back to this article. Like this, this not the article, the ad. Okay, this, this uh -huh. like, this is, and so me and Alan, we grew up in Montreal, Canada, and Twi uh, Kicks never toured. You know, we never had radio airplay, but we kept seeing that ad over and over <laughs> again. Just give me some background on this ad. Like there was a Kicks ad, and like, who's Kicks? Who's Kicks? To the point where, if you watched MTV or Much Music up here in Canada you would eventually see a Kicks video. And I even remember being in North Carolina and seeing Kicks play at a bar, like, you know, sort of the mat, uh, the marquee. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it just, but it, we've never had the chance. So just tell me a little bit of background on this ad, a little more on this, if you don't mind. Well, it was just our attempt at, at getting the word out that we're a band, we're on Atlantic Records, which is, you know, should be a very powerful label and, and should be doing this. We shouldn't have to do it. Yeah. And we just thought it's the only way to get to let people know that we're out here. And little by little, people would bite and they would go, OK, I'll, I'll get that album. That was for the Midnight Dynamite album, our third album. Uh, up until that point, I don't know if, if we did that ad before that or not. But um, it was just our way of trying to get out there, trying to, to let people know that we exist. How, how much did it cost you? It must have cost a pretty penny back then. Um, I don't think so. I, it was it was I don't know, maybe I honestly don't know. I, I, right. I would estimate four or five hundred dollars for each each time we did it. It was, it was every month, yeah. Yeah, but it goes back to what you were saying. There's no way you guys should have been doing that. That was a record tape. Exactly. But you know, we felt like they're not doing anything, so we've got to do it. At, at same when it came to touring, um, they were for Midnight Dynamite. We we put out a song called Cold Shower, made a video for it, and got very little. MTV airplay and the record company was done with the record after one song one single and it was done and we thought fuck this so we just took all of our money that we would make from the east coast from Boston to New York to Philadelphia to Baltimore and DC and North Carolina we'd bank our money then we would take it out to wherever people didn't know who the hell we were like Cleveland Cincinnati Chicago Texas and then we finally made our way to LA and had the boys from from Poison hook us up with a couple of shows. So it was just our relentless attitude that, you know, it's never say die attitude. And we would uh, use up all of our money, go back home, make another pile, then go back out and do it again. You know, you know what amazes me about this album? I go, this is the probably one of the better kicks albums, like a really good album, like your solo album. That is it's really oh, good. I, I'm, and that's how I, I want to come across like this should have been a kicks album. And and I find that in the early years, in the first few albums, you were underutilized. After hearing this album, you should have been. I mean, was what was that all about? Like, I mean, why? Did, it seems like you could really write a great tune, and and your voice sounds better than ever. I mean, geez, that's, that's nice. Um, well, we we had a pretty damn good songwriter in Donnie Purnell, and unfortunately, he ran a band with the Iron Fist, so it, you it was hard to to um, it was hard to contribute because he was so intimidating and in getting his music done first. And I would bring a song in here and there and they, he, it was almost like, a, hey, go ahead and record your song. I'll, I'll give you a day in the studio. Then we would spend two and three weeks on one of his songs. So it, it wasn't very enjoyable to bring songs into that band because most of them got shot down and you always felt like you were inferior. So, and trying to contribute on his stuff was like impossible because he just, he had such a, a, a insight on how he wanted his music to be presented. So, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, not to take anything away from him as a songwriter, because he was a great songwriter sure, and sure, we really believed in, in the music that he wrote. All right. Well, I'm just, oh, just and this solo album, I'm listening to it. it. It sounds so familiar, but like new at the same time. I'm, I've never had that experience with another album. <laughs> That's nice. Not the compliments. Yeah, <laughs> it's a golf you, you want to say it's kind of like Aerosmith, and you got a lot of harmonica on it. And yeah, just, well, yeah, but it's nothing. It sounds like it could be bass and rollers at the same time. It's just got that pop <laughs> element to it, you know. It's funny about all the harmonica stuff because I'm not a very good lead guitar player, 
So just so I don't have to listen to chords playing over a lead section, I'll just throw a harmonica on it because I can play a harmonica. And when we went to record the record, I'm like, okay, we've got to get some leads in place of all this harmonica. And everybody goes, no, man, the harp's great. Leave it alone. Don't, don't, don't go over that stuff with, with just licks. And, and you know, they're, they're very well thought out solos. And so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm game. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, I, I got to say Kid Dynamite is um, probably the best. When, when I listen to that song, yeah, it's got the meaning behind it is, of course, you know, uh, with Ronnie. Right. But mm. that song sort of like I got transported into, I don't know, another time is that it, it's got that sort of what I think it's the melody. It's because there's it's just so it's sort of the it's so contagious, the melody or it's so. uh you could really hum it like it's a great written song i just a great melody it could be a commercial for like i don't know a tv commercial a song or you know i i don't, I don't know where i'm going with this but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you can i just I, I just feel like day. it doesn't fit in today's world it just fits sort of like in the past somewhere well, I don't, you know, I don't write in any kind of genre or any kind of direction. I just, I just sit around and bang on my acoustic guitar and something starts to come to me and the arrangement will come into place. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not really ever trying to like copy another song and, and use that as a, as a recipe for a new song. I just, I just kind of bang stuff out. And if it, when it's done, I record it and people like it. Great. If they don't, it just sits around. I've got a bunch of stuff sitting around. <laughs> Have you ever met Bon Scott? Because I'm hearing those ACDC Bon Scott era riffs, oh, know, especially off of Easy and uh, talking about love. There, there is, there is ACDC. There's the Bon Scott. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. But we were, I mean, Kicks was heavily influenced by ACDC and, and Bon Scott was one of my favorites of all time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you ever meet Bon? I never did. No, we, we got to meet ACDC, I think on the, for those about the rock tour, they were they were coming to town. They're on Atlantic Records, and our record exec took us to to see him and meet him backstage. But no, never had the the pleasure of meeting Bond. I just I just love that feel that you have and, and your voice, man. You know when they 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 were talking about replacing uh, Brian when he was gone. I think you would have probably been the best replacement. I, 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 am I am I wrong about the salad? Do you hear it? I'd have done it. Because <laughs> you, you could do Brian and Bond. Because you could do Brian and Bond. That's why. Yeah, but you know what? I thought Axel did a hell of a job when, when he yes, went he out did. and toured with him. He did a he did an amazing job. So, hats off to that. Because that that shit's hard to do. That's hard to say. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, and again, like going back to Jimmy's earlier points, you know, you listen to first Kicks album and then you listen to second one and they're 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 quite different you know and then you listen to the third one and that's different so this this wouldn't be outside of the kicks wheelhouse doing an album that's this poppy if you want to say or this yeah. different i think you've always done something yes the main grooves maybe acdc sound is but the, the overall feel of an album changed from from album to album yeah our first albums our first two albums were were definitely written in the bars and during sound checks and um it was definitely lighter and poppier and uh and i think we took a, a new direction when donnie started writing with outside writers for the midnight dynamite album and it got obviously heavier and everybody seemed to like that direction more than than the older way that we were approaching our, our album so we kind of stuck with that for for the next one and then blow my fuse and then hot wire so yeah we got we definitely got heavier after the third album and, and alan was asking me before were you part of the the sound was very LA at the time, I guess, 83, 84, 85. Mm. But were you part of that scene or you were strictly staying on the East Coast at the time? Never. We never, <laughs> we never wanted to conform to that. We wanted to be an East Coast band. That's, you know, we were proud to be from the East Coast and not having to travel to Los Angeles and put flyers on cars and eat ramen noodles and go through all that bullshit. Cause we were, we were doing really well on the East Coast. And mm -hmm. although we never really financially made a whole lot of money individually, but we made a lot of money as a band, but we just reinvested it back into the band. So um, never made any real money in that band. Never, never got a royalty check in my life. So it was really? just for the love of music that, yeah, that just that kept us so going. At Atlantic, all these years that, that you've sold, you know, I'm sure you've passed the million mark. 
all these years, they, they just what they they gave you advances, and that was that, and then you yeah. never saw a cent. Yeah, and you can't pay the advances back on on the on the shitty record deal that you sign when you when you first sign with them, and unless you have a hit record, you know you're you're at their mercy. You can't go in and and go, well, we we sold eighty thousand records, so we want to redo our record deal. They just laugh at you, yeah. so it's impossible to pay back those advances of like eighty thousand, a hundred thousand, and they. They, you know, they send you to New York City to make a record where we could have made a perfectly good record in Baltimore and mm -hmm. for half the budget. But that's how they get you. That's how they nail you down and get you under their thumb is uh, get you in massive debt. So um, you can't ever get out of it. And they never have to pay you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like the pizza guy, the pizza money. delivery guy, they, they, they mark it up a little more. Right. The coffee yeah. guy, they mark up they, every little thing that they do. They use as an expense towards your exactly. advance. Right. Exactly. We made our first album in New York, made our second album in Miami, third album back in New York, fourth album in Los Angeles and the fifth album in Los Angeles. So, you know, they take us out to these expensive places to live and expensive studios. And, and then they expect, um, you know, we can't expect to pay back all that money with our, our 10% and after the, the record producer takes their percentage and the agents take their percentage and like, there's nothing left. Yeah, yeah. Alan? It's just so, it's such a familiar story. I mean, we spoke yeah, about it every week. We're from Helix. Helix. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it just keeps sending you invoices. There's no way it can ever pay this, you know? And if you happen to be the, the principal songwriter, well, that's the one they're gonna focus on because he's probably the one that's got the best chance of paying them back. Correct. It's such a familiar story, and maybe those days are probably over. Maybe it's a good thing in certain ways that they are. So, yeah, record companies are about done, which is you know I'm I'm good with that. And um, when I was uh when I was trying to put this record out, I I didn't know how, I had no clue of how to even how to get it out there. So I, I had to get people to help me out, and um it it's it sold a couple thousand, but it, it, it's not moving any. You know I'm not I'm not flying up the charts, and that was never my intention anyway. I never really intended to make a solo album. It just kind of fell into my lap and I had the music and Brad and Jimmy and Bob Perry were really excited about it and they helped me out and made a good record. I'm trying to figure out the meaning behind a uh, prick teaser. I <laughs> <laughs> Really? I was, I was kind of sitting on the next. Thing. What does he mean by that? That's the next Viagra sort of jingle. <laughs> <laughs> um, a prick teaser is a girl that that says, "Come here, come here, yeah. come here. No, get away, get away, get away. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Now get away, get away. That's, that's a prick teaser. So you know, she comes off, she flirts, and but when it when it comes time to get down, she she goes, "Ah, no." Nah. No, no. I I kind of figured that much. I'm just trying to make a little joke. When you're writing, what about like, are, are, did this motivate you to think of, you know what, I want to write another solo album? You know, this, this really, this really went well. I really dug the songs or maybe you want to use those songs for kicks. Um, you know what? I don't, I don't look ahead like that right now um, because of I'm so involved in kicks that, that that's my primary, uh, that's where all my attention goes to right now. People are asking me if, if I was going to go out and do any do any shows with this new music and i'm like um probably not because uh it, it, it kind of gets in the way with with kicks and people are going to expect me to do kick songs if i go out which is what i did in funny money which yeah. is why i had to let funny money go because everybody come out to hear the kick songs and then kicks was out playing too so it's like now i'm i'm kind of hurting the big project to do this little project so it didn't make any sense anymore yeah i hear you and we got questions here, and I, I could read them out, or Alan could read them out. Go ahead, Jim. Who were Steve's inspirations? I mean, I think you kind of touched on that, but go ahead. Um, I had a lot. I mean, I started. I started with the Beatles, of course. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kill surprise. <laughs> they're um, they they're the reason, and I'm and I'm I've heard thousands of artists say this. They're the reason that I do this because. I'm old mm -hmm. enough that I saw I actually saw him the night on Ed Sullivan and I'm I'm like I'm in that's what I want to do, and I was I was into the Beatles, then it was it was more like like pop pop band and even the Monkees the Monkees were had great songs even though they didn't write them they had great songwriters they and, did and then I got into the bands like Grand Funk Railroad Alice Cooper James Gang, um, Deep Purple all those all the heavier bands so I kind of went away from the Beatles and got into the heavier stuff. And then along come Aerosmith and ACDC, Led Zeppelin, and that's what really got my attention. That's that's the kind of direction I wanted to go in. The song Strip off of this album reminds me of that Alice Cooper feel, especially when you come back with the strip song at the end. 
<laughs> reminiscent of the movie Slav Shot. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but that's sure. kind of the same song that they use at the end of the film as well. So yep, yep, yeah. <laughs> That one, been, uh, that that song, I've been sitting around for about eight years, and I finally finished it up. And I I always struggled with the with the verse to that song, and then I it finally hit me one day. I was listening to Ragdoll by Aerosmith, and I'm like, oh, they're changing the chords around. I'm just staying on one chord. I got to change the chords around. And that's when it all clicked. <laughs> okay, so thanks. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. Here's a question from Patty saying, uh, Steve, which song is your favorite song or your most preferred? Of all, or just I, I on guess, the I guess, I guess. Well, well, how about this? We'll take one from the solo album, and then we'll say one from the kicks. I like the way Prick Teaser turned out. <laughs> just, I, I like the acapella intro. I, I just I, like, I, yeah. And I, I like the meaning of the song. I, I like the arrangement. I, I think that one turned out really well. And Do Me, I like a lot. Okay. Right. And as far as, I don't know, kick songs, there, there's so many. And we've been doing them for 35 years, so I don't. I can't really pick one, you know, there's a bunch of them. One of my favorites to do is off of the, the Rock Your Face Off album called Wheels in Motion. That one's okay. a lot of fun to play live. Uh, but which, which song do you hate performing live oh. out of the kicks? Oh, that's Set. easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cool I'm kicks. so tired of doing that song and doing that stupid rap that everybody knows what's coming, but they got to hear it. And she threw up all over the floor. And you, ah! <laughs> that's old as shit. So we haven't been doing it lately. I'm like, I can't do that damn thing anymore. All right. 12 pack wants to know, didn't kicks tour with rat back in the day. Yes. Yeah. That was our first arena tour. That was the first band that ever invited us to come out and join them in an arena tour. It was, it was rat, Brittany Fox and kicks. Brittany and, Fox. Yeah. Brittany Fox. And they, well, it was a great tour. It was, it was great fun. Great guys. We had a, we had a lot of fun on that tour and got to know those guys really well. And, I still see Stephen once in a while because we we either open for him or he opens for us, and uh, we, you know we reminisce about that tour and just had a great time. Here's one: Joe P is saying, "Any chance of a vinyl reissue, other than Blow My Fuse, which was already been done? I recently played 150 bucks for a vinyl version of Hot Wires. Oh. I think it's worth every penny. So, bottom line is the question is: Any chance of a vinyl reissue, other than Blow My Fuse?" I think they're working on that. I do believe okay. they are working on that. And this um this this solo record that I just put out is is out on vinyl now. If anybody there you wants go. to, there you go. There you but go. you got it. There's only there's only one source for it, and it's called the Head Vinyl Shop in Hagerstown, Maryland. So anybody who wants one, just Google the Head Vinyl Shop in Hagerstown, Maryland, and and Rick Parks will hook you up. You brought up Britney Fox. I'll throw out some band names from the 80s around the time when you were starting out. Just your thoughts, if you remember them, anything about them, like, like Heaven with Alan Fryer. Yeah. I, I mean, I knew of them, but I was, I, I had a, I had blinders on when, when we were going through that. I mean, bands, I grew up in the 70s and, and, and the 60s, and those are the bands that, that always influenced me. So the newer bands didn't hit me as much. I mean, Obviously, bands like Def Leppard you'd listen to, Rat I'd listen to, um, White Lion I got into, but I didn't. I didn't really check out all the bands that came out at that time because, like I say, I was I was going down my own path and so busy. I, I didn't really care, and I loved the old music that I grew up with. Now, East Coast guy, what about Riot out of New York City? I knew of them, but again, wasn't on my radar. Okay. Now you guys, there's not many bands from Maryland. There were there weren't that many bands that broke out of there. They're at least that sort of on the mainstream level uh, that You're I right. know of at least. There was one band called Crack the Sky that that broke out of here before we did, and another band called Face Dancer that that got a, a a record deal and did a couple of albums. But other than that, you're right. Not too much has come out of here. I mean, yeah, there was the thrash, there was the speed metal, but not really in sort of the hard rock vein. You know, sort of yeah. the melodic hard rock. Wrathchild was another one. Wrathchild was a USA. Uh, remember that? Yeah. Not, yeah, not UK, USA. Right. <laughs> there was two. <laughs> and Fort Fate's Warning coming out of Connecticut. The Connecticut's not exactly a hotbed of uh, of metal either. You have bands coming out of there, but right. Well, I mean, bands like Extreme come out of the Northeast. Twisted yeah. Sister come out of the Northeast. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah. there there were some. What about the relationship be between uh, Kicks and Bob Halligan Jr.? Who's you know known for Judas Priest? You got an uh, some heads are gonna roll, Helix, Rock You, 
and who else? Uh, and, and I guess so many songs by Kicks, especially, you know, the songwriting or co-songwriting. Yeah. Well, that was that was Donnie Purnell and, and Bob. That Those two would get together. We really, I mean, we would see Bob in passing, but I never really got to know him or anything. It was, it was just a, a writing relationship between him and Donnie. Okay. You never were, you never were invited to those writing sessions or you never, fa- did nah, that really bother invited. you back then? Like it would bother me. I don't know. Hell just... Yes, it did. Yes, it did. <laughs> but you know, it was what it was. And I, I, I just, I, I accepted it. Okay. Uh, Alan, what else you got? No, I mean, I just, some of the, the songs here. off the album, uh, you know, bad blood, I think is my favorite off the album. Uh, well, yeah, that's my favorite too. Shock, you got shock's got a little bit of East Coast twisted sister feel for me. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Okay, I can see that. And uh, you shook shook me in my shoes. I think that's a great closer. Yeah, and and you know, that's 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 a silly little song. <laughs> Here's another question, Steve. What do you think of L.A. Guns? I mean, there is a little bit of L.A. Guns vibe sometimes in your songs, or we could say the other way around, right? Yeah, L.A. Guns has a little bit of a kicks vibe. I'm a big fan of LA Guns, and we get to play with them every now and again. So yeah, I'm a big fan of those guys. And you guys played with Queensrÿche too, like in the later years, right? Yeah, yeah, we still see them once in a while. We all all the bands, Dokken and and Queensrÿche and and Stephen Piercy and God, I um, the M3 Slaughter. guys, yeah, the um, M3, so, the M3 yeah, sort exactly. of circuit, right? Yeah, that you know? that eighties genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at other questions here. A lot of people are writing stuff, so I'm trying to keep up. That's why I'm going this way. So one of the things <laughs> I had, Steve, a question was li- listening to the lyrics on this album. You know, you're a certain age, we're a certain age, and it's it's like they're adolescent almost. Are you, were you targeting that to, like, guys our age that were trying to relive the 80s or just, hey, these are pop songs, and that's what we sing about, guys and girls? It's very adolescent, and th- that was on purpose. And and I'm, I'm just a horny asshole, so I like. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah, well, tell the truth. But you know, I, I always like music and lyrics that are funny and fun and have double entendres and and you know, there's nothing nothing more fun than sex and and women and and so that's what I like to write about. And even ninety percent of it's made up and bullshit, but you know, it sounds good. Steve, Steve, did you draw the album cover, or did, did. you bring? Did you bring in some sort of artist to? I will show the album cover. Eric yeah, Riggs. There, there it is. is. Was that like who did? Did you bring somebody in for that, or what, what's Are going on kidding? there? This is the original. <laughs> this is what I. The, the, the girl that was helping me out said, uh, "What kind of an album cover concept do you have?" And I'm like, "I only have one idea, and and it's dumb as hell. And if you don't like it, I understand." So I drew this. And took a picture of it, and she said, "We're done." I love it, and it's like this took me like two minutes to, to do. Print two thousand copies. Yeah, yeah, but you know, yeah, I, I like funny. it. It's cute. It's cool. I like it. It's cool. I like it too. Yeah, so yeah. That drawing, like you, you were saying, it, it comes from maybe uh, when you used to sign autographs, and everybody wanted you to write something special. You just started right. des- designing this, right? Right. I got. I ran out of things to say to people, so I just started drawing a stick figure and saying <laughs> it was me. So, uh, it, and it stuck. Every every now, every, when people want my autograph, they want the stick guy too. <laughs> All right. So, uh, will there ever Joe P is saying, will there ever be another Kicks album? I'm assuming yes. I never say never, but you know, in this in this age of of trying to to make new music, it's expensive to make, and it and it doesn't sell that that much. So, uh, business wise, it's not a good idea. I, if we were a rich band that had a, a a bank of money to go to go in and and draw from, we would more than definitely do it. But it, it kind of comes out of our own pockets, and if, if it doesn't reap much of a reward, it, it's kind of hard to justify it at this point. Um, and we're, we don't have a record label and because they're kind of worthless anyway. So like I say, I never say never, but at this point there, there's nothing in the pipeline. Okay. Do, do you find that if you're strictly a touring band playing the songs people want to hear and that's kind of like where you've decided that that's where you're going to go and uh, when, when COVID is over, that is. Uh, yeah, I mean, and well, we're still playing. I mean, we got the Monsters of Rock uh, cruise coming up pretty soon, so yeah, that's a hoot. And yeah, I mean, because we're playing all over the country, 
and the people that do know us, they want to hear those songs, those, those songs off of Midnight Dynamite, off of Hot Wire. They want to hear those. So that's pretty much what we're what we're giving them. And it seems to be working because we started this in 2008, I believe, and it's going strong in, in 2022. So whatever we're doing, it's working. Mm-hmm. Hey, just a question. We have uh, Michael Sweet is a friend of the show. He's often on he was saying how some band just because of their reputation as a Christian band won't tour with them. So if Michael calls you tomorrow morning and says, we want kicks to open up for us on our, our next tour, what would the answer be? Hell yes. We, we've, we've played with Sweet several times. There yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mike's a great guy. Yeah. Know him well. Yeah. And he's an East Coaster now too. So. Uh, oh yeah? Yeah. Well, he's a yeah. Boston area somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Up okay. There. Right. Yeah, Plymouth, Plymouth, Mass. Even saying. though he is originally from the West Coast, um, wh- what about uh, Ronnie? Is he okay? Is is, is Ronnie? Like, Ronnie is. Um, he was pretty much being supervised in a in a halfway house for about a year, and and I believe he's finally got his freedom. So we're just kind of waiting to see how he continues to recover, because it, it was it, it got ugly there for a while, and we want to make sure that he's got his his family life together, his own life together before bringing him back into this, you know, this temptation that, that is just around all the time. So we're all pulling for him. We all, you know, we we're in touch with him and um, just it, it, it's a waiting game at this point, just, just to make sure that unsupervised, he's going to be able to keep it together. Well, they say the first thing is when you try to get off any addiction in life, it's to get away from what you used to do and your old habits and your old yeah. friends, right? Yeah. So that's where it becomes, and, and at least a year of sobriety, you need to sort of at least stay away from all those. And you're supposed to actually not ever go back to that because those are the triggers. Right. right? Yeah, that's, that's what we're waiting to see. I mean, I know the fans would love to have him back and we would love to have him back, but it, it, it it's got to make sense for everybody. And right now we've got, uh, the guy that come in to help us out to replace Ronnie, Bob Perry has just been doing an amazing job. And um, I don't want to rock the boat, you know, at this point to, 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 to take a chance. So we're, it's a wait and see game to see how, how he continues to recover and, and can he continue with his sobriety and get his life back together. Steve, did you ever fall in those traps when you, when you were like in the early days? I've never been a druggie. No. I mean, I, I like, I like alcohol after a yeah. show. I like to have a couple beers, a couple shots of Jack, yeah. but I've, I've never really fallen into, into into the drug thing. It's never, never been my thing. I don't like not being in control. Yeah. So, and alcohol, you can get to that point. Where you go, okay, that's enough. But yeah. drugs, you don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. No, no. It's it's fun at first, but the after, Canadian yeah. border guard to take you away. That's enough. Yes. <laughs> All right. What else can we say about your new salam that you'd like to talk about? Would you like to talk about your salam? Um, pretty much, I, I think I've said pretty much what, a, how I feel about it and how lucky I was to have the people around me to help me make it mm-hmm. and how pleased I was when it was all finished and the great job that Brad Divins did when uh, recording it and producing it. Um, I was, I'm just really proud to be able to put something out at my age and, and have the local fans appreciate it. I had a lot of people locally who, who bought it and really like it a lot. So that makes me feel good. And it's almost like a bucket list for me. So even though I never really set out to, to make a solo album, but mm-hmm. when the opportunity called and we and we pulled it off and, and did it well, you know, it's um, I'm, I feel real good about it. What else is on that bucket list? Anything else that, you know, out, out, of, out of the re- <laughs> you know out of the box, right? Is there anything else out of the box you'd like to pursue? I'm not a very adventurous guy. I mean, right now I'm, I'm pretty happy in life. I've been doing what I love to do for uh, all my life, practically. I've been playing music since I was 13 and I'm 65 and I've never done anything else but play music. Mm-hmm. I met the love of my life 38 years ago and I've just, I, I've had a, a pretty, pretty good life. So no, bucket list is empty. So you're done. Yeah. You know, we we we, uh, we interviewed Matt Barlow recently at his project Ashes of Aries, and it was a labor of love for him too. He kept repeating how he made no money off of this. He just right. wants the fan. Looking back, like you said, it's a bit of the same situation with the, your welcome here. If you were to release this as a kicks album, do you think it would have done better? I don't know. I don't think any. I, I don't know how many copies our our last record did. Rock your face off. It, it may have done. 
eighteen thousand. Which you know that's nothing. That that that's 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 a that's that's a that's a shitty amount. But back in the day, you know, a, a failure kicks album would sell seventy eighty thousand copies, and then when Blow My Fuse finally went platinum, so records these days just don't sell and and there's just the money is is touring and merch that's that's the only way you can really make money yeah and here's backstage guitar tech says what did you do when grunge came out where did you work well we 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 put it down in 1995 we stopped playing we we decided to to stop playing and um officially the band was broken up Mm-hmm. And I just started teaching vocals and guitar and anything I could do to to keep the family fed. And then eventually I got talked into starting Funny Money. Mm-hmm. And so I was playing Funny Money on weekends and teaching through the week. And that's what that's what kept me alive until um, we, a, a local promoter came to, to us and said he would love to do a, a kick show. And we didn't even know if we could call it kicks because we didn't. We didn't know who actually had rights to the name. So we called it four out of five members of Kicks. And we did we did a local show and it did amazing. I mean, like thousands of people showed up for it. And it just kind of, you know, it made us lift our eyebrows a little bit and go, maybe we can do this a couple of times a year, and make, you know, make a good chunk of change and leave it at that. So that's what we did for about three or four years. We just stayed in our little comfort zone in Baltimore, DC, Harrisburg, and and did like maybe six shows a year and that was it. And then I get this call from an agent, Sullivan Big. He was a huge Kicks fan. He's from Boston. And he said, I can I can get this band out touring again if you'll give me the opportunity. And I said, you're out of your mind. Nobody gives a shit about us anymore. In fact, they never really did. <laughs> and he t- he had me on the phone for a long time. And, and he he finally, I relented and said, go ahead, you know, go for it. I don't, but I don't think anything's going to happen. And he got us um, Rocklahoma. It was the first yeah. time we played out of our comfort zone. And we played in front of like 20,000 people and they all went ape shit. And we're like, holy hell. It's amazing, isn't it? How it yeah. just comes full circle, isn't it? Yeah, we had no idea that people knew or cared who we were or what we did. And that just opened our eyes and that gave him the green light to start booking us and that we just get more and more jobs every year. Wow. It, the it the, seems the to, metal yeah. community, the fans, there's no nobody more loyal than the metal community. And there's right. good proof of that. Yeah, you're right. What about overseas, like in Europe, Japan, Asia? Do you find that there's also now people are starting to take notice? Um, I don't know. More? I mean, back in the day, we played Japan. We went over there. We I think we played over there three times. We played the UK a couple of times. We played uh, Sweden Rocks. But for the most part, we've never really taken off in Europe. And other than the Blow My Fuse album, I don't think I don't think the people in Japan care anymore either. <laughs> oh. I guess you got to keep touring, right? With, yeah. with no yeah. record company backing, it makes it all that much harder, right? So. Makes it really hard because, you know, it, uh, we can't afford to go to Japan. <laughs> it, it's so amazing. You sign with Atlantic Records, which is probably one of the big guns back then, right? And and you're kind of like, and there's no support. It's just, it's yeah. just mind-blowing. It, it, well, we we were also managed by Doug Prager, who was also managing Foreigner at the time. He was on Atlantic Records. So we right. had Atlantic Records, Foreigner's manager, how can this not possibly work? It's very possible. It didn't work. What do you think was, do you think it was just timing? Do you think it was not promoting the right, the band the right way? You know, what do you think it was? The songs were there, definitely were there, but what do you think the on a marketing perspective? I think being on Atlantic Records, which was a huge label, had so many acts. I mean, they would put out 12, 14 albums a month. And if it didn't stick, you know, they, they just moved on. So it was just being probably in, in too big of a label. And uh, they didn't know how to promote us. I mean, they didn't know if we were ACDC or if we were the Knack. They, they didn't know how to, they didn't know how to promote us. I like this 12 pack goes, I'd like to hear Steve hit a note, please. <laughs> that's a note. That's right. That's like, a, that's all you get. That's a C. That's all you get. All right. <laughs> That's pretty much it, Alan. Oh, great. Hey, I enjoyed the record. Hope it sells uh, some more copies for you. And, uh, you know, we, we, these labor of love should be uh, rewarded for, for what you've done. So that's that's a part of the show today. And hopefully we've generated some interest to, to get a few more copies out there. Well, hopefully I can I can steer people in the right direction. You can get it at, at it's, it's called Right Rock. and right Or rock. you can just go to, to kicks.com. 
and just mm -hmm. hit the merch button and it'll, it'll take you there. So you can get, you can get the, the physical CD or if you want the vinyl, like I said, it's the head vinyl shop in Hagerstown. How hard so, have you been hit by a uh, COVID for the band? Like, I mean, is the band just like, Oh, well, we all got it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, oh yeah. We got, we got vaxxed. And then we, then we all got, we got vaxxed in Jan or February and March. Then we all got COVID in September oh, <laughs> and wow. then we all got boosted. And now we're just, you know, now Omicron's here and the boosters don't work against that. So we'll probably get that too. <laughs> That's yeah, pretty much everybody's it. it's difficult but like you said during this period it enabled you to write this album right yeah and that's what we're hearing from a lot of people we're interviewing that we can't tour there's the solo album toddler tory was able to do that with queensrike he took that time and biff byford and there's so many artists that benefited from that time yeah and you got to rest your voice on top of that i did i did and it was nice because I, it, it did make enough money that i could give everybody a little bit and then take everybody out to some nice dinners that's that's what we all enjoy you know just go out with the wives and everybody and don't care about how much it costs just pick up the tab and go that was fun yes <laughs> yes i agree i agree so thank you for being on my yeah, pleasure everybody, everybody go pick up your welcome and uh you know catch kicks at m3 right uh, yeah, hopefully that'll still be going on. I'm assuming that's going to be going on. They did it uh, last year. They'll probably do it again. Okay. All right. Well, that's pretty much it. Unless you have something else you want to say, maybe uh, some websites or. Um, just, just that you can, you can also get the, the digital copy off of Amazon, Apple music, all that, all that good stuff. But, um, you know, anybody that, that is a kicks fan, I think will like this record. And it's, it's just a, a it's a fun, playful record that, um, that, I'm really proud of, and I hope people will give it a chance. I agree. I agree. It's a great melodic, a great listen, and I was I was very surprised. I thought it was really good. I thought it could, should have been the next Kicks album. That's what I thought. <laughs> I'll tell the guys that. Tell the guys that. Show them this video after. All right. All right. <laughs> Steve, All it was right. a real pleasure, and I'm glad I, I'm glad I got to revisit the Kicks catalog with you with you and. Uh... Put out another Thank ad. You. Who knows? <laughs> Put out another ad. You never know. <laughs> it's only a couple hundred bucks a month. <laughs> hey, oh, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks.